having an unlimited, potentially unlimited number of asylum seekers who can apply for protection in, in a country. On resettlement, we had a no resettlement option, a low resettlement option, and a high resettlement option. On return to harm, so that means a key question in asylum policy is what happens to people who've been refused protection for whatever reasons? Are they sent back? Under what conditions are they sent back? And of course, within the Geneva Convention, we have a strong non refoulement principle, which says that people should not be sent back to places where they could face serious harm. So again, one of our options is the status quo, refused asylum seekers are never sent back to dangerous places, or in some cases, people are sent back. So these are the policy features that our respondents are shown. They are only shown one of them within each of these dimensions. On family reunification, we have no family reunification for recognized refugees. Um, current status quo, uh, there is family reunification, or we have a limited option, whereby family reunification depends on the migrants, on the refugees' ability to pay for his or her family members coming in. Okay? We have decisions on asylum, whether or not this is decided by national governments, as it is the case now, or by a centralized European Union agency, and then we talk about financial assistance to non-EU countries. Is there financial assistance, yes or no? And the middle option, the B one, says that your country only provides financial assistance if that country helps us reduce the number of asylum seekers coming to Europe. And again, our goal was not to find out whether or not people support these very specific policies. The idea is to get behind the principles. Is there support or not for moving away from the, for the principle of non, non refoulement for example, of whether or not people should be sent back to dangerous places? So these are the dimensions, and that's an example of a conjoint task. So as I said, we have our six dimensions, which are just uh, named in the first column. Then we have policy option A and policy option B. And these policy options differ randomly in terms of the policy features that they are shown. Now, it so happens that this particular example, only the policy options only differ in terms of the last two dimensions. The first two dimensions, the policies look the same, but the last two dimensions on financial assistance and on family unification, there's different, different uh, differences there. And we ask people, do you prefer A or B? And we ask that five times. And as I said, that allows us to analyze what's called the average marginal component effects, which basically means what we're able to do is we're able to assess the impact of a particular policy feature on the probability that an individual accepts the overall asylum and refugee policy package um, relative to a reference category. Um, and the reference category, the reference category always the first the, the first options that I show here, we're trying to make that as close to the status quo as policy making um, as possible. So the question is, is there support for moving away from the status, status quo? And I'll, I'll show you some of the results um, for all countries, first of all, uh, then I'll show a few results for individual countries and then I'll, I'll conclude. So what this chart shows you, as I said, is the average marginal component effect. So what that means is that you see how do particular policy features influence public support? The dots on the dotted line, these are the reference category, okay? So the ref in com compared to a policy that has no limits on the annual applications for asylum in a country, what happens if you look at the policy features of having a limit, a limit on the number of applicants? You see there is about a five percentage point or six percentage point difference. So having a policy that has a limit, increases the acceptability, the probability of that policy being accepted by about 5%. There's a positive impact. So people have a preference for limits in that particular uh, policy area. So all the dots and confidence intervals that you see on the right-hand side refer to positive effects. So these are policy features that increase public support. On the left-hand side, you have policy features that decrease uh, public, public support. So uh, what you see here is that People have a preference for limits. If you look at resettlement, compared to no resettlement, high resettlement is considered negative. People don't like high resettlement, but they don't re distinguish between low resettlement and no resettlement. Interestingly, on non refoulement should people be sent back to dangerous places in some cases, across all our countries, we have a negative effect. So maybe somewhat contrary to what we often hear in public debates, that Europeans are very hostile, they want to send lots of people back to dangerous places, we really don't find that here. A policy that sends people back to dangerous places actually has a negative impact on public, on public support.
People are also not supportive on denying family reunification. So in the family unification dimension, the option of never possible, again on the left-hand side, so there's a negative impact of denying family unification on overall public support. But what people want, uh, what people prefer here is to have family unification policy that requires um, refugees to cover the costs of their incoming family members. You see that cost of living dot on the right hand side compared to the always possible, always possible option. An interesting result uh, on governance, EU agency versus national governance. Now we ask, I should clarify, we ask a very sharp question. We asked whether or not, basically we, the policy option was that a centralized EU agency assesses and decides all applications for asylum in Europe. So which is kind of an extreme version of EU involvement. This is completely centralization. And what we find is that EU involvement is, is having a negative impact on public support for, um, for uh, the policy here. Of course, that doesn't mean that people would not support more EU involvement, which can take many different forms, but we find case on, on the kind of sharp policy of having complete EU centralization and an EU body deciding on asylum applications, we find that this is a negative impact. And finally, on, on financial solidarity, financial assistance, we find that people prefer conditional financial assistance to no financial assistance at all, that people have a strong preference for providing financial assistance to countries on the condition that these countries help with um, reducing the number of asylum seekers coming to Europe. So these are quite specific results, but overall, if, if we were to sum up these results, we argue that this shows that in general, Europeans are committed to providing protection to refugees in the sense that they don't systematically prefer the most restrictive option. It is not the case that uh, sending people back to dangerous places or that denying family unification is the most preferred policy. That is not the case. So Europeans want to offer protection, but they want to do so using certain limits and conditions. I mean, that is a second clear result. There's a very strong uh, public preference in the countries that we uh, analyzed for providing protection using certain limits and conditions. And in a way, that, that's the level of general, generality uh, in which we would like to talk about our results rather than looking at the very specific uh, policy features, as I said, which we just used to, to analyze support or opposition to some of these fundamental principles. Now, um, these results actually are for all countries, and they're surprisingly and remarkably similar across individual countries. So we often hear in public debates that Europeans are hopelessly divided on asylum and refugee issues. Now we find not exactly the total opposite, but we find that there are many similarities in the broad pattern of public preferences. Uh, so this is Austria, uh, where I'm from. The Austrian uh, preferences, uh, uh, the pattern looks exactly the same as the, the average across the eight countries that, that we looked at. Sweden also looks exactly the same. France looks very, very similar. Germany looks, looks very uh, similar, um, except perhaps on, on family unification, where there isn't a, a strong difference between um, all making family unification always possible and never possible. A lot of other countries had a very uh, negative um, um, attitude toward uh, denying ref, uh, family unification completely. Hungary, so we often think, hear about Hungary, obviously the government has a, a very strong and negative stance towards asylum seekers and refugees, but even in Hungary we find that there's no, we don't find widespread public support for sending people back to dangerous places. Um, we don't find that denying family unification has a positive impact on policy, has a negative impact on policy. Uh, where Hungar Hungary stands out, and this is perhaps not surprising, is that the involvement of an EU central agency is, is negative, uh, as in other countries, but the magnitude of the effect is much bigger. Uh, so it's strongly negative. Um, Italy, Italy is the only um, country in our sample where having an EU agency assess and decide asylum applications does not um, have an adverse impact on the acceptability of the overall policy package. I mean, we can discuss why that might be, but in Italy, it seems that Italians are uh, much more positive uh, about the role of the EU in the uh, processing and decision-making on, on asylum. Uh, Spain, um, interestingly, really looks a little bit different. In Spain, both low resettlement and high resettlement are preferred to no resettlement at all. Remember I said that high resettlement 
a lot of other countries, in a lot of other countries that has a negative impact. In Spain, it actually has a positive impact. Um, and in Spain also, uh, people uh, don't distinguish, don't have a strong preference for regulating family unification through uh, some sort of limits. Um, so conclusions, as I said, we find that generally Europeans are committed, that's how we interpret our results, but they have a strong preference for limits, for using limits and conditions. The overall pattern of policy preferences is remarkably similar, and, and, and we think that this goes against what we hear in public debates. There are these hopeless divisions. So I think there is a basis for having discussions about how European countries can, can work um, together on some of these issues. Uh, my final slide, the, the work that we're doing now, looks at some of the relationships between attitudes to different policy features across the different dimensions. So one question we're investigating now is whether or not people perceive a trade-off between access, so between letting people access protection and then the quality of protection provided afterwards. So we're investigating that. And in another paper, um, we are looking at how policy preferences are influenced and conditions by trust in political institutions. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Could we switch the slides, please? Okay, I see someone is running. Thanks to the magic hands <laughs> in the director's room. Mark, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I think it's a very important uh, report or very important uh, research that indeed um, uh, closes some of the gaps, started to close some of the gaps uh, we have uh, in immigration literature. And uh, I would like to start, um, start off my comments with a reference to my own research. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I uh, published, uh, together with my colleague Ines Michalowski, a short piece on um, what we call the new agenda for immigration policy research, uh, because um, you might you can believe it or not, until recently at least, there was very little research on immigration policies in general, and especially even fewer research on more quantitative research uh, on immigration policies. Uh, and only recently, some um, researchers have started to uh, build indices, databases that allow us to compare uh, different countries and to do more systematic analysis of uh, the role of immigration policy, to understand immigration policies, to understand the causes and effects of immigration policy. So this is uh, still very little research, but there's uh, um, a, a new agenda or the emergence of a new research field in this, uh, in this area. That, for example, allows us to study the effects of policies, for example, on attitudes uh, among natives towards uh, immigrants. That's one of, the, one of the research questions that has been tackled. Uh, uh, recently, and there are many others. But one aspect we didn't discuss uh, in this paper because there was simply no research on this specific aspect is uh, the, the research that has just been presented, namely how policies are perceived. So we know um, how people perceive immigrants, how policies affect uh, or do not affect the integration of immigrants or the attitudes we have about immigrants, but we have basically no knowledge about how uh, policies are perceived uh, by the general population. I think in that sense, uh, this, uh, this research makes an important, um, uh, an important uh, contribution to this field because uh, this is John was uh, one example of many, uh, many examples we have nowadays on studies that study attitudes towards uh, immigrants or in this particular case, uh, asylum seekers. I don't want to go into the details. This is just to show you um, uh, one way with a similar, actually the same method. Um, it is also used to um, study attitudes towards immigrants. And as you see, there are many different categories that are uh, studied. Um, uh, j just to give you an example, for example, which kind of uh, profession uh, people uh, prefer. That unsurprisingly, you see that doctors, uh, immigrants that are doctors, are preferred over immigrants that are cleaners. Uh, or here you see so more positive values on the right means more positive attitudes, and values to the left more negative attitudes. That Christian um, asylum seekers are preferred over Muslim asylum seekers. So we know a lot about about these different characteristics of, of asylum seekers, of migrants, uh, which groups are preferred. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we don't know anything at all. What actually this is now, uh, we have some only first results now from this study. Um, what actually which uh, specific attitudes uh, people have towards uh, specific uh, regulations. 
So therefore, I see several strengths uh, uh, of this study, several contributions focused on, on, on policy preferences, but also the differentiation it, uh, has been mentioned um, of different policy dimensions, because often we think uh, people just make a different, uh, we just differentiate between restrictive and, and, and uh, more open uh, policies, but people might actually indeed have uh, different preferences of, uh, on different dimensions uh, of policies. Also the fact that uh, they compare um, different countries is, is, is quite important. Um, most of the time, most of the research in this, in this field focus on individual countries, so we do not really know whether we find similar patterns in, in different countries or not. So I think that's another important strength of the study. And also maybe for, for, for me personally, that's even one of the most you know, interesting uh, results or argument in the paper is that they try to go beyond this dichotomy of opponents and supporters. That's how we um, like to discuss political issues in general. People are either in, in favor or against uh, uh, policy or especially in the field of immigration policy but as the study shows, um, people do actually differentiate, even ordinary citizens do differentiate between different uh, dimensions. They're not in general in favor or against uh, liberal or restrictive um, uh, policies. And, and, and this I think is also true, but we do not really know that because there's not, not yet that much research in general. Also on ad f is also true for attitudes towards um, immigrants in, in, in general. So um, we know, for example, that uh, some research has recently shown, or more and more research shows that, that for example, left-wing liberals that are in general very tolerant uh, might be you know, more, more skeptical when it comes to specific immigration groups uh, like religious Muslim immigration groups. Their attitudes are sometimes getting more critical. So that shows us that uh, the tolerant people are not always tolerant. It really depends on, on, on which uh, immigrants uh, we are facing. Or, for example, we also know um, that there's a very high support of uh, political refugees. So there are studies that show that almost everybody, up to 90, 95% of the people, are in favor of accepting uh, political refugees in, in contrast to other refugees like economic refugees, which shows that uh, it is not always true that a, a majority or at least a, a big ma minority of the population is against immigrants. It, it really depends on, um, on uh, which immigrant groups uh, we, we talk about. And this shows that it's much more complex than just an opposition between uh, people in favor or against uh, immigrants. Um, but I think we need much more research on this specific questions because uh, my suspicion is um, that attitudes really depend or are contingent on specific aspects, um, you know, uh, economic, uh, cultural context where the unemployment uh, rates are high or low. Uh, also on policy outcomes, are we talking about a high number or low number of immigrants? Uh, are they well integrated or not well integrated? Depending on these factors, of course, attitudes might become more positive uh, and, and negative. And I think another aspect, and th th this is the, the, the focus of, of this study here, are the rules and maybe also the general norms and general principles of the policy. So depending on, on the specific rules a country has, attitudes towards immigrants might be getting more positive, more welcoming, or uh, 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 more critical. And there's also some other research I, I briefly want to show you that also um, goes in that direction and tries to study the principles uh, of immigration policy. They do not study uh, immigration rules in, in the narrow sense as this study does, but also focus on the general principles. This is a study I think is also mentioned uh, in the report by Van et al. Uh, i just uh, give you one, one short example here. Here in this, in, in this survey, uh, in uh, I think all European countries EU countries, um, people have been asked what kind of uh, what kind of principle they prefer to distribute asylum seekers within the EU. Do they prefer the status quo? So that's uh, on on the right side. So that means that uh, the, the rule that it's always uh, the, um, the country of of entrance that has to deal with asylum seekers, uh, should we keep that rule or should we uh, switch to a rule where every uh, member state country gets the same amount uh, of asylum seekers, that's the middle category, so almost no, nobody is in favor of that, of that principle. But the large majority um, of the people uh, interviewed are in favor of a proportional system so that asylum seekers are distributed according to the size and economic capacities um, of a country. And as you see, this is true um, almost to the same extent for every uh, country. So irrespective of the size of the country and the um, economic status or the economic development uh, or the number of immigrants they had in the past. So all these people actually um, um, prefer the same, the same rule of distribution and maybe that's also some kind of a confirmation or confirms what I've seen just before that actually attitudes towards these principles or rules are very similar uh, ac across countries uh, within, uh, within the EU. Um, then I also would like to give you an example of my own uh, ongoing research where I study 
attitudes towards uh, climate uh, change, um, refugees, also um, a field that has uh, been hardly studied so far. Uh, where I'm interested, and these are, this is data from, from Germany, uh, where I'm interested under which uh, conditions, under which principles uh, people are uh, willing to accept uh, climate change refugees. So, and here I differentiate between uh, ecologists and non-ecologists, so people for whom um, um, uh, environmental aspects are important and um, that are more left-wing, contrary to the non-ecologists that are more uh, right-wing. And then I um, <coughs> provided in this survey, on this experiment, different arguments on which conditions climate change refugees should be accepted. Is it a, a general morality issue? So everybody in need should be accepted, uh, irrespective of the reasons of why um, people leave their countries. Or should it be according to a, a principle of corrective justice? So it's those countries that are most um, responsible for climate change that should uh, accept more climate change refugees than others? Or does it depend on their capacity? So that's uh, similar to the proportionality argument we have uh, heard before. So that bigger countries, more richer countries should accept more uh, asylum uh, um, climate change refugees than others. And then I also differentiate between uh, provided different information on whether we might expect a high number or a low number of climate change refugees in the future and to see how people react to, the, to this, uh, towards these different arguments. And to see among the left-wing ecologists, all these arguments do not really matter. They're all in favor of, uh, of uh, to, to accept uh, climate change refugees. But when, it goes, uh, when you go to the right, we see a more skeptical attitudes, but also a more differentiated um, uh, more, uh, more differentiated opinions. So there you see that it actually depends on the specific arguments. Uh, the capacity arguments has a much higher impact than the other arguments. So people are willing to accept as, uh, asylum um, climate change refugees under the condition that the, the richer countries or the bigger countries accept more of them than the smaller and the poorer countries. But it also matters uh, what kind of information you give them on the numbers of immigrants, um, uh, future asylum seekers. So if uh, you, we ca can expect a low number, they are more willing to expect them, accept them than, than a high number. So this is just another example of how general principles um, uh, might actually have an impact on, um, on, on, on the willingness to accept a certain policies or certain groups of immigrants. And I think this might also have important policy implications because it very much depends on how you frame policies, uh, what arguments you use, uh, why um, certain groups of immigrants should be accepted, what kind of rules that should be adopted that uh, has actually an important impact on, on attitudes towards these policies. And, um, <coughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm about to finish, so, um, um, just the last part of my presentation is that I think uh, that this, uh, this uh, project, uh, this um, uh, research um, lays, might actually uh, lay the basis for, for a new research agenda. There are many aspects that are important here and that can be developed in the, in the future. Um, and then that we can study in more detail. Maybe that's also some kind of a criticism or something that can be done differently in the future is um, the problem of policies, of course, is they are often formulated in a, in a rather abstract way, and that's also how it is done in this, in this, in this questionnaire. The question is always how do people actually com concretely understand these policies? So if, if uh, we use terms like until annual limits are reached, as, as you have also done in the survey, or in some cases they are sent back, what does that really mean? What do people understand by that? Um, we have seen that in the past, or still see that there's a lot of controversy about uh, quotas, uh, maximum capacity of a country, so these terms are often used in political debates, um, and then also people talk about it, but we do not really know what that means, um, so what is, what is the maximum capacity a country has, or uh, what does a quota of 100,000 mean for a country, is this uh, uh, much or not so much, or compared to what, so uh, it's actually maybe very difficult for, for people, for us, for everybody to really make, uh, you know, make sense of, of this, uh, and um, I think maybe we need more research on that, also more qualitative research to better understand how these specific terms are uh, understood. Um, then um, I think the, 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 the project team is also working on this specific question, um, you know, which are the people who prefer these policies? So we have seen some average uh, um, um, uh, findings, uh, what the general population thinks, but maybe some people think differently depending on their education, their income, uh, other preferences about uh, specific uh, issues. 
then I think it, I think it's also important for the future to theorize a specific policy dimension. So it's important to differentiate these policy dimensions. But the question then is also, uh, do they all mean the same? Uh, so there's uh, questions about the, the specific conditions why immigrants can be accepted. That's well, one kind of dimension. But then there's also questions about the procedures. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, um, at, at a different level um, and, and kind of different meanings and also different importance. So some issues might be just more, way more important to ordinary citizens than other dimensions. So they might care, they might have an opinion on the procedures, but maybe it's just not important to them. They care much more about the conditions. Uh, I think that's also important to know which dimensions are more important to understand um, their general opinions. And of course, it would also be nice then in the future to have other policy fields and not just asylum uh, policy field, because in a way, you might argue that it's a little bit an easy case in the sense that, as you have seen before, people are not so restrictive when it comes to um, asylum seekers, they are more tolerant or more open to accept them. Uh, so we might actually find different, um, come to different conclusions when we look at uh, labor migration policies where there might be more controversy or more polarization between supporters and, um, and uh, opponents. But in any case, I think uh, this research shows that there's uh, a lot to be done. And um, um, I think, it, in, as I said in the beginning, it closes important research gaps, but it also opens uh, new research questions that should be uh, tackled in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. So, um, Dilara, I would like to open the questions and the discussion in our panel um, directed to you. Um, as I said before, you joined the European Parliament in 2019. I've been here just one year, and um, in this one year, my perception and understanding of how asylum migration policies in the EU are done has certainly changed and hopefully evolved a little bit. Um, I would like to ask you, what has been so far the most striking change in your understanding how um, these policies are done here in Brussels? Um, so actually, um, I th so thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, it was very interesting to hear to your study because also, of course, it makes something with uh, with politicians as we want to implement policies and we have a value-based approach as socialists and democrats when it comes to the question of migration. But um, to see how we can go in, into the public debate with our ideas is very important. So thank you for um, your study. And... I am actually for 106 days, I'm a MEP now. I'm, I was elected in May and I got into office in July. So uh, until now, I can only share the twist that I, that, that I experienced when I come from campaigning to the parliament and to the situation. Because when I was campaigning, um, I, I was campaigning a lot and also in different European countries as I was the lead candidate of the Young Socialist in Germany. I was um, campaigning all over Germany, but I also was campaigning in Poland. I was campaigning in Italy and Spain and Denmark. So very, of course, also very different um, debates we are facing in this member states on migration. And every time um, there was the, I, you can say that something was poisoned in the debate because the question of migration was seen as a threat or it was not, um, see, uh, it was seen as something that is not in political control right now. And this is not because what is offered by the European Union as policies, it's because how we talk about it. We, we talk about floods of people when we mean people, we talk about migration crisis, when it's actually a humanitarian crisis, when people are dying in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and we have reaction on that. We ha don't have only right-wing populist parties that come up and reacting with, um, with the protection of border. We also have people, civil society movements. In my city, Kiel, where I live, there were 10,000 people on the street to, um, demanding that our city if the member states of the European Union don't get, don't get along, that we can take the refugees when, when the ship is um, seeking for a secure harbor. So we have a very different debate about what is something like, um, what is the political solution, what is the feeling people have. So I always experience that if you ask people, when we, when we take the question of limits as something that, um, that is relatable to a lot of people that say, okay, if it's controlled, even especially in Germany, if there's a controllable amount of people that come to Germany, and uh, this sounds good first. And when you confront them with saying, 
okay, what if you, if your fam family, you would be in the situation, your family member would be the 1001 who might not get there because the limit was reached. Then something is happening in the way we talk. So I think we always have, uh, as politicians, we have the duty to, to make it visible that it's about people we are talking about. And this is something that actually started ki kind of interesting uh, since I'm in Brussels. What we had done so far is, uh, as you know, the commission, the new commission is not set yet. We had the hearings of the uh, commissioner designated. And I have to say that, especially in the field of migration and asylum policies, the hearings were very vague and inconcrete. I can tell you why they were vague and inconcrete. Because the, actually the European institutions um, who work together on a daily basis to find solution, the parliament and the commission, they done the homework actually in the last legislature with providing for a new distribution mechanism. What is happening so far that it was blocked in the council, so in the member states. Despite this fact, uh, we still have the, the perception in the member state that the EU is not delivering on migration policies, although it's the member state that block a very pragmatic solutions, which I think when, when we would give more um, ambition to, uh, to explain this, um, this distribution mechanism to the people, um, it might have, um, make sense to the people. There might be a positive reaction on what um, was um, agreed on between commission and parliament. So, um, it's always very interesting to hear that the, the reason why we don't get progress is because of the European Union and about the European Union is failing to deliver on that point. So I think that we really have to watch out what is the next um, steps we are doing from a European level because we have the situation that right now the, the commissioner who will be responsible for the migration topic, Skinas, um, is, uh, his title will be protecting the European way of life. And I think this, this title, um, and it's not only me or my group, it's um, actually whole the progressive group in the, Euro the European Parliament, we, we say that this is something that admitting that the right-wing discourse has won, that the right-wing discourse of externalizing the problem of migration, the problem of migration at the borders of the uh, European Union might be the solution, which is definitely not the case. So what I'm um, thinking, what I want to offer you as something, um, not only talking about the externalization about third countries, is something that we can, uh, we can have a next try within Europe, how we can tackle the question of distribution. So there was one. Sorry, one uh, uh, question to the distribution issue because you, um, yeah. you referred to your work with uh, communes and cities in northern Germany who are willing to accept uh, migrants rescued in the Mediterranean, for example. Of course, uh, currently we do not have an official limit, but uh, we have kind of an implicit limit because the number of people is relatively small compared to the previous years. Do you feel this is like an unconditional support or could we also see some change there if the numbers would um, grow again to the extent of 2015? Well, the, the protest started very early. So um, what we are referring to, it's, it's actually a European movement. It's not only in my region. We are very progressive on that point, but it's not only my region. It's um, cities and municipalities who say, OK, if the European Union can agree on a distribution, we are ready to take these refugees. And th this is something that is not possible right now due to the limitations we have, as there are no, um, no uh, hardly um, any refugees coming right now, and there is no um, rise of the resettlement progress, of the relocation programs. So even if a city declares, and it's over 70 in Germany right now who declare that they want to, be a, a to, to take um, refugees um, and take more refugees that are, would be distributed to them by the German system, which is called the Königsberger Schlüssel. So we cannot tell because it, there hasn't been the possibility. What we see is that more and more cities are d d defining themselves, uh, declaring themselves to want to take more refugees, but they don't get the opportunity as it is always stuck in the council um, where, we can, w where we don't have a, big, a bigger floor of people who is coming. So we cannot tell um, because we don't we don't try. This is actually the problem. We always talk about solutions, but we don't try to solve things as we don't give the opportunity to, tr to, to, um, yeah, to do it because we always block the progress. One question, if I may um, 
I said at, at the beginning, Martin's results might give us some reason for optimism in the sense maybe we are not as divided in Europe as we think we are, at least on the level of uh, citizens. Um, but you said um, yourself before you're part of a political platform that, for example, in Germany uh, rejects um, annual limits to asylum seekers. If you ask the Christian Democrats in Germany, we have this limit. If you ask the Social Democrats, they say we don't have the limit. So two parties came out of the negotiations and said completely opposed things. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering for the political side, is it really good news that we are not as divided as we think? What can politics make, make of this? Um, it's a very good sign that we're not divided because it, it's, it gives the task to, to politicians to de deliver solutions that convince people um, of being right. So this is actually the best situation you can have when you want to, to change something um, that, you can, that, it, that you can convince people with good concepts. And I think the distribution mechanism on a local level is a good mechanism where we, where we could say the, the cities, the municipalities that are ready to take refugees, they should be allowed to. And that we have a European fund that supports the cities and that we can have a change in discourse of um, where we go away from the protection of our borders for protecting from migrants. We can go to see migration as something that is necessary when we, to, when we look at the demographic situation in, in Euro most of the European countries. And also, um, it's an opportunity um, for the society when we say it, it comes with financial support. So this is actually a, a rethinking of a distribution mechanism. So I think it's a very good sign that we're not as divided because we sh it shows again that here in the parliament, we achieve um, a common ground when it comes to distribution. We see that the member states where the individual <laughs> Um, governments come and um, and um, negotiate with each other, there we have problems to find a common ground. So I think it's a good sign that a strong European um, solution has to come from the parliament where the people are represented and we uh, see that the people of the European Union have a similar approach to it. So of course we um, ha can we can work with that good, but we have to, to solve the problem of block being blocked by the council on that field. Thank you. Uh, Ola, I would like to hand over to you. Um, in the work of the, of the IOM, of course, the organization um, comes in touch with citizens um, in all EU member states. I would like to ask, um, in the IOM's work, does it reflect basically the similarity of attitudes towards um, migrants across countries or do you see a greater division in attitudes how people on the practical level let's say um, respond and work on this issue so this uh, thank you um, thank you also for the presentation i think it's welcome with this non-binary approach it gives a deeper picture on things to try and, and respond to your questions, we are active in all EU member states, basically, and, and looking at the areas that you covered in, in your study, we do resettlement. Of course, this is the study on, on predominantly refugees and asylum, where we have close cooperation with the UN agency on, on uh, asylum and refugees, UNHCR, but we play quite a significant role in this. We do resettlement the movements, the pre-departure um, orientation, medical exams, post-arrival integrations, et cetera. We work very closely with a number of EU member states on assisted voluntary returns and reintegration. We work closely in the areas of family unification where we assist migrants and member states alike, and also the area which you mentioned on, on the financial solidarity to host countries. <laughs> Of course, we as a global organization with 173 member states are active in those areas. Uh, we don't do these kinds of surveys on, on attitudes in member states. Um, you, you can see how different in, in, in certain areas. We, don't, we know that all EU member states don't do the same level of resettlement. There's quite a variety. Most member states, I think, now do resettlement, but it's a very, very varied numbers. Uh, I think that is, is it's all voluntary. There's no EU legislation that makes it obligatory. There is some uh, financial incentives, and of course those are used. Uh, 
I think the area of return is, is more communalities by the, between the EU member states in, in the views of this family reunification. There is, of course, EU legislation. But I think overall we can see the different level of activities that we have in the different member states. I don't know if, if that would necessarily translate into different attitudes. Um, adding back to our presenters, I was just wondering what you uh, both favored about your study approach was you go beyond the supporter opponent dimension basically in your work, which you both saw as a positive, and which I would also see as a positive. Um, however, when we talk about politics and political implementation, of course, there are opponents and supporters of certain uh, policies who are maybe not as keen to see the um, common ground, but to rather polarize a debate for um, their vote share outcomes. So I was wondering how would you like both of your research um, to matter for the practical level of European politics in this field? Martin, would you start? Well, I think what we're trying to do is to inform public debates. I mean, our aim is not to say that policy should do X, um, I think it's very important for policymaking to know um, what public, public attitudes and public policy preferences are in this area. Um, and so going beyond the binary of support and oppose means that I think we should have many more discussions about policy design. So it's not, the question is not whether or not we support refugee protection. It seems that most people prefer, prefer some sort of protection, but exactly how should this be done in a way that's sustainable and that also has the public support. So I think what we wanted to show is, first of all, or what, what the study does show is that we're much less divided than we think we are uh, based on wh what we hear. Even some of the countries that have governments that are very openly hostile to um, um, asylum seekers and refugees, uh, such as Hungary, actually we find they're you know, rather similar uh, to the publics in other countries. But I think the emphasis should really be on debates about policy design. You know, what, what types of policy features really make up a sustainable policy in the longer run? So we simply want to generate discussion about some of these issues related to policy design. Yeah, um, that's cool. So, um, yeah, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's uh, the, the aim of all that kind of research is to somehow uh, establish the facts or to, um, uh, you know, create some knowledge about how people think about it, how, how, how uh, we all think about it and, and what the effects and perceptions of these policies are. Also maybe, and that can be actually a policy implement, uh, um, implementation or, or a policy um, effect that um, often the, the general public is also instrumentalized by political parties or by political actors. So it is said, well, the people th don't want this or that, so that's why we don't introduce this or that policy, So, but without actually knowing anything about, about these preferences. So that kind of research actually uh, shows us, well, it's actually more complex than we think. It's not just everybody in favor or against, or they are more in favor of this or that. Uh, so I think that helps also provide some arguments against certain, what I would call, instrumentalization of, of, the, of the broader public. And um, also what I think is important, that's, uh, that's why I brought up uh, some other uh, projects, is the way you frame policies, the way you argue about policy, um, also have an effect on how these policies are perceived, depending on you know, the reasons you provide why we should accept, uh, in my case now in my research, uh, uh, climate change refugees, obviously uh, seems to have an effect on, on, on people's preferences. Uh, so the way we talk about it, and, and obviously p parties uh, talk in different ways about it, uh, that has an effect on, on how these things are uh, perceived. And I think also, um, coming back to, to uh, one aspect uh, you mentioned before about the abstract and more concrete uh, uh, problem. So often, um, I mean, may maybe that's also one of the limitations of the, that kind of studies. Uh, policies are often very abstract, and so it's you know difficult to know what, what people really understand by that. 
and often they have some general views on while well, we are more in favor or against more restrictive or liberal policies, but once you show them some concrete examples, and there's actually um, also uh, ex experiments that show that if you ask people, are you in favor of or against uh, restrictive policies, they might have a very strong opinion. If you show them a concrete example of a refugee family with kids and you show them even a picture, that, that's what they do in these kind of experiments, attitudes change rapidly. Uh, if they see what the, you know, the concrete impl uh, implications of such a policy can be. Uh, so, so again, I think the way we talk about it, the way we present these policies can have an important effect on how, on how, to what extent these policies are then also accepted. Thank you. Before we open the floor to, oh, you have to. Okay. Thank you, Delara, for coming. Yeah. Um, I have some results to announce. Um, if you may have noticed, when you came into the conference room, you were handed a small uh, vote card and you were uh, invited to uh, give your vote. And as you might have guessed after seeing Martin's presentation, not everyone got the same vote card, but we randomized a bit among you, uh, meaning half of you got a vote card where you could vote on um, whether you want your country to accept asylum seekers without an annual limit, and the other half got cards where you could vote on whether your country should accept asylum seekers only up to an annual limit. And uh, randomization work, we have exactly the same number of votes on each card. The results are um, the yes votes for accepting asylum seekers until an annual limit, 39%. Um, the yes votes for as accepting asylum seekers without an annual limit, 82%. So um, not saying this is the same design uh, as Martin used uh, that we could not replicate here. <laughs> That's a small indication. Um, and I would invite a quick round of comments on this. Um, apparently in Brussels, um, this experiment works the other way around, meaning removing limits increases uh, support. Um, maybe a quick round, last round from you. Um, do we have a representation problem of citizens' attitudes in Brussels? Well, I don't think I'll address that specific question, uh, but I will answer a question which is relevant to this. I mean, so would you, the, the question that you've asked is, um, would, in our research, we would have called a kind of a unidimensional question. You ask just yes. one aspect, yes. and the, the whole point of our experiment was that um, actually uh, there's often a social desirability bias in some of these questions. So when you ask this question, people don't often like to, uh, or people don't always, um, reveal particular preferences because they think it is um, socially unacceptable. I'm not saying that this is the case in this room, but uh, the, uh, the advantage of doing it in a contract is that everybody always faces a bundle of, of, of policy features. So um, some of the trade-offs can be analyzed that way. So I think the advantage of, of doing it our way is that you can, you know, at the end of the day, it can only be one specific feature that you really don't like or that you like that makes a difference for you when you compare the different policies. But in a straight up survey, if somebody asks you, do you want a limit or do you want to send people back to dangerous places, you would kind of never answer in, in, in that particular way. So I think, um, as Mark said, I think there's a lot of politicians who make new proposals arguing this is what the public want. I'm saying this because this is what the public want. And I think it's a really important um, responsibilities for researchers to find out whether that is actually true or not, whether, you know, what does the, what do the public think about these things? And uh, and again, I think one of the implications of our research is that uh, we find that it is not true that the European public is universally hostile and and and, and rejects uh, uh, um, refugee protection, um, even in some of the countries that we often read about in the papers, Hungary, Poland, that have been refusing to to cooperate with other European countries um, uh, on some of these issues. Ola, maybe a uh, last question to you. Um, as you've uh. come here from uh, Sweden, um, how do you uh, observe the differences in uh, representation maybe from a national institution to um, an international one like the IOM? I'm not sure I have a good uh, answer to that question. It's, it's, it's a different environment, of course, working for an international organization with 173 member states coming from very different parts of, of the migration 
uh, flux and, and working for one specific government under specific circumstances. So, so I think that it's, it's not necessarily, it's, it's two different environments really that, that needs to be taken into consideration. And also picking up what Martin said, this is again, uh, migration is, is both a very complex issue. There's the both what was put, put to it in, in this survey, there's both the internal and the external dimension of this and you managed to put it. And I think the external dimension has been more predominant in, in recent years with, with all kinds of ideas on, on how to externalize things. Uh, I think this is also uh, what, what you said about what the politicians answer to, to public opinions, but also what, what we also need to think about what to what degree are those policies based on facts and figures? How much data do we have? How do we foresee that, do, uh, do we pilot those projects that, that we think would address public opinions? I think it's, it's a bit more complex than that. Yeah. Thanks to all panelists, also to Delara Burkhardt who had to leave us unfortunately to rush to the next meeting um, with the life of a member of the EP. But now we would finally like to open the floor to your questions. We will pass around the microphone. We would invite you to use it so that everyone can hear you. And of course, to keep, you, keep your questions brief so that many uh, members here have the possibility to ask their questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation and the discussion. I think it was very interesting. I have a question and an observation. My question is whether your uh, samples are representatives of the national population, because you have, uh, if I'm not wrong, 12,000 for every country. And I would like to, s to know something about the representativeness of the samples. And the observation is that, uh, well, I presume that Prefer people's preferences uh, are the result of culture, knowledge, and information. And uh, if I reflect on my own country, Italy, uh, the information about uh, the refugees, seekers, uh, and, uh, well, uh, dislocation uh, policies, uh, are very much biased. So I would like to know, and this perhaps is something that you can add to future research, of course you cannot do everything in one research, to uh, consider how knowledge of the phenomenon is influencing preferences. Because uh, you seem to assume that policy makers should follow people's preferences. But if uh, the preferences are biased with respect to what they think they know about uh, the phenomenon, then uh, it's the duty of policy makers uh, to try and change uh, their preferences. Thank you. Martin, on the representative. <laughs> yeah, just briefly, thank you for those questions. So, so there were representative uh, samples um, in, in all, the, all the countries. And uh, yes, you're right. Um, it's a very important question what determines some of these preferences and uh, some of the current work that we're doing looks at precisely that and the role of information in a way. I mean, that's a big research area. We are not, we're not specifically looking at the role of information, but we're looking at um, the paper we're doing now, looking at um, trust in political institutions, also including the, the European um, Union. Now, just briefly on the role of information, I mean, we, we focused on principles. In a way, yes, of course, people's views might be um, shaped by what they know about how many asylum seekers there are and all of that. But we try to ask questions that are really about the principles uh, about policy making rather than, you know, do you think um, asylum seekers are good or bad for the economy, for example, because that, if you ans answer that question, you need to know how many there are. So surely information matters. But again, our focus was on principles. And finally, just a comment on, you made a point that we assume that policy making should follow public attitudes. I mean, we actually, I mean, we say somewhere in the, in the Madame report explicitly that in a way we don't assume that. So we're not doing this research 
because we're making a case that policymaking should follow public attitudes. Of course, in a democracy, in the long run, we would argue that you cannot have sustainable policies if they don't have significant public support. However, there can be good reasons, more legal, why you know, we don't always want to do what the public wants. But the point is that I think everybody will agree that it is very important to find out where public policy preferences are in this area. So no matter what your particular case is that you want to make, you need to know what are the opportunities and what are the constraints in terms of public attitudes. And I think that's what we're trying to do. We're not, we're not assuming, uh, we're not doing this because we, th we are making a case that public attitudes should be decisive. No, far from it, we think that we need to have a good understanding of what public policy preferences are in this area for effective policy making. Thank you very much. My name is Eva Schulz. I work at the Swedish Permanent Representation here in Brussels. Uh, thank you for very interesting research and results. Um, I uh, had a reflection which is a bit similar to the previous one, and I listened also carefully to what you just replied now, but I, uh, I, find, I find, as I said, the, the research and the results very interesting. I, I, I could uh, personally and, and spontaneously, spontaneously see some risks when, when I saw the results being shown in the graph in the sense that uh, they are to s there are to some extent, and, and you highlighted it yourself, some, co some um, contradictions and picking up on one, one of the final reflections of, of Mark on this uh, research about how people understand policies and what they understand, for example, by annual limits. Uh, and, and that's uh, where I said that the, the my reflection is a bit similar to the previous uh, reflection as well. But governments uh, sometimes, of, of course, governments want to, to understand and know about public perceptions. But I think the problem sometimes is that uh, governments are too keen to follow or possibly steer public perceptions in the short term uh, over a period of mandate, over a legislature. And our politician on the panel has left, but, but governments are also sometimes, uh, and have uh, the task, the, the, the responsibility to, to present possibly uncomfortable policies that are not necessarily going to be welcomed in a situation of a humanitarian crisis where there has to be a responsibility taken at national or at EU level. Uh, some uh, governments want to, to, to I, I guess, I assume, also steer a bit or influence uh, the public perception. So, so um, not necessarily expecting complete replies or responses to that because I agree that it's important for policymakers to know what the public perceptions are, but what about those situations where governments are really uh, responsible for, or have the task actually, because that's also what they're set there to do in a democracy, to, to make the uncomfortable decisions that will not have in the short term the public support. Yeah, just briefly, thank you for that. I mean, I would, I think, agree with most what you said, and I think, but I think the implication of, of, of this work is, goes back to what Mark mentioned, is that what comes out very clearly, there seems to be a demand for policy controls in one way or another. So limits and conditions, and we can, we can debate about what these mean to different, different people, but I think, uh, so I'm expressing a personal view now, but there seems to be a sense in many European countries after the large inflows in 2015 that a lot of governments have lost control. There's a sense of a lost control. And it's that loss of control that often creates, certainly increases in the salience and the importance of the issue to many people. And therefore, I think it, the research has implications for communication because there's no doubt that projecting the idea that yes, you want to protect, but yes, you know, we, we, there is a sense of control seems to be very important to get through to people. So I think even if you want to implement policies in a way that, that, that say yes, we're not just gonna you know, blindly follow public attitudes or public uh, preferences here, but even if you, you know, make a strong moral or legal case for protection, uh, I think the research implications for the language, for example, that you use to say that, look, there's all kinds of safeguards, there's all kinds of limits, we're, we're trying to manage the situation in this way and that. I think it's that loss of control that really affects uh, public policy preferences in a, in, a, in a negative way. And limits and conditions are, or can be a way, we argue in, in, in the next paper, in a way of reducing some of the uncertainty that people have um, about a lot of these issues. <laughs>
if I could just say something on this point of, of knowledge and the information, uh, because this often comes up in these debates, uh, we have to inform the public or we have to inform people or we need more to know and then people will turn reasonable or whatever. Um, and I think especially in this field of, uh, of migration that is a highly normative and emotional issue, I'm not always so sure what what knowledge really, what the impact of knowledge is and what knowledge actually means in the first place. Of course, you can inform people about the number of immigrants and the quotas, and, but as I said before in my talk, I'm not, not sure whether we or anybody, what our understanding really is of, you know, the quota is 100,000 for this country and 50,000 for another country, what does that really mean? Is this a lot? Is this, is this, is this, is this is not uh, so much uh, compared to what? Um, and I think the, the, the only field where I see um, where knowledge could maybe have an impact is uh, when it comes to economics. There's a debate, you know, do immigrants uh, help uh, harm the economic, uh, the economic situation in the country or not? Do they, does it um, come to profit from, from immigration? That is a lot of research that shows that actually it does. But I'm not so sure whether people really react to that or whether this makes uh, opinions much more important because in the end it's a much more cultural issue and in the end it's a normative issue and the more uh, fundamental question of what kind of society do we want? Do we want a more diverse, culturally diverse society or not? Uh, how important are humanitarian uh, uh, values for us or not? And I think these, import these are important issues and irrespective of how many people die in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, I think this is much more important and helpful than informing people about the exact numbers or the economic impact because in the end uh, I'm not so sure that people really care about these issues. It's more a broader issue about you know, what kind of society do we want and I think that's the kind of arguments that need to be discussed uh, among researchers or politicians. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rafael Shilhav. I'm the Migration Advisor for Oxfam. Um, Following up maybe on the last two questions, I wonder has there been any kind of research or any kind of involvement of uh, refugees or asylum seekers in this research? Um, because perhaps some of the uncomfortable feeling around this is really that here we're asking a population about their rights and the situation of another population. Uh, and refugee population by definition are not represented in their country of origin, they're not also not represented in their country of arrival, uh, where they're not part of the political process. So I wonder in terms of designing this research or another research, how can they be involved? How can we understand better their expectations? They might not be exactly the same way that we think they should be. Um, maybe that's a missing part between the research and the policy making. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I think you raised a very important point, and I, I do think it is very important to include um, voices of asylum seekers and refugees in, in the debate about <coughs> what should be done. What we're trying, what we're trying to do in this project, in a way, is to study the attitudes of, of publics in different European countries. So in a way, we didn't. It wasn't limited to citizens or so anybody. So I, I mean, we can check. Our sample also included um, immigrants. In those, in those countries. Um, but we were specifically focused on trying to understand you know, what, what the characteristics of public support for particular principles and for particular policies. Again, um, the idea is not that that alone should be decisive in terms of policy making because it is obviously very important to consider a whole range of other issues including the voices of the people who are affected by this. Uh, but of course, fact is that the status quo is that policy is being made uh, routinely in a way um, uh, based on certain perceptions and understandings by certain policymakers, and we were trying to basically critically interrogate some of these understandings thr through that work. But of course, I agree with your general point that in, in the governance of this whole issue, it's very important to listen to uh, asylum seekers and refugees and, and their voices and representative groups. Yeah. Okay, I see no further questions for now. Um, then I would like to thank first of the, uh, you for your question that you've asked. Um, again, to our panelists. Next time we will do an even bigger conference so we can do more voting experiments with you. Thank you all for being here today. I hope you enjoyed this panel and uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>